the way I need to love you. I'm not there yet. You know that. He was being brutally honest in front of the other apostles before God. You know, I think sometimes, I don't know about you, I'm going to speak about myself. Sometimes um, I like to believe I'm further along than I really am, but God knows, he plows through all of that. He knows how we fall short, how we're not where we need to be. And despite the fact that Peter wasn't where he was supposed to be, God said, feed my sheep. In other words, I know that you don't love me as much as you need to love me. Go do my work. I had never heard anybody refer to this passage in this way. Most times when you hear anyone preach about this particular passage, you hear them say, and this is true, there's nothing wrong with it, that there's a parallel between the three denials and now the three affirmations. But you never get the breakdown of the words that are being used and the kind of the farewell address that we got uh, right before graduation. This is what one of the professors shared with us. That's kind of our setting forth. So I thought I'd share it with you. Um, we know that, you know, part of the process of being Christians is, is acknowledging our, our lowliness. You know, uh, one of the things that Pope Francis has been talking about besides joy is humility. Somehow or another, those two go together. Uh, of recognizing where we are and yet still doing God's work. So, I'm going to leave you with that for a moment. Go ahead. Father John Ricardo on uh, Catholic Radio had this same talk. And he prefaced it with the fact that where is Peter in all of this? Well, Peter's been told by Christ, you're the rock. You're going to be the head of the church after I leave. But he's blown it. He blew it on Holy Thursday when he denied Christ three times. Mm -hmm. So he really doesn't know what his position is in all of this. So that's one of the reasons why he falls back on what he knows. He's going to go fishing. And that's when Christ appears on the seashore and cooks the fish for him. And then he asks, then they go through these questions. So, was Peter ultimately changed by all of this? Good question. Well, I think that we, certainly after Pentecost Sunday, we see that um, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, you know, he's armed to do the task that he's been given, including dying on an upside down cross. Um, so, just let, just let that kind of just um, incubate for a moment and let's uh, move on. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna, the 13th of June is the feast day of St. Anthony of Potter, who's arguably uh, one of the most popular saints of the church. Not, not as popular as St. Francis, but pretty close. Everybody knows who St. Anthony is. I'm sure everybody in this room has called on St. Anthony for lost keys or glasses or something once. And so what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of background information. If you go to our YouTube channel, uh, Tom actually gave, Jack and Ed, gave a talk on St. Anthony a few years ago that he did a really good job of summarizing some of the key points. So what I wanted to do was kind of give you a little bit of a refresher, remind you of the YouTube uh, video that I'll probably post up later today, or maybe on the feast day itself, and then talk a little bit about him. But I wanted to tie to this idea of patronage. <laughs> Hopefully you all have a patron saint. When you, when you were confirmed, did you take a name? Yes. Is anybody here who did not take a name when they were confirmed? A new name, other than your own name. Oh, very good. You did? I don't remember. You don't remember? Okay, fair enough. All right. Well, I did. 
Um, I, I took on St. It's my confirmation saint and my patron saint is St. Anthony. And I didn't know anything about St. Anthony Podcorn. Back when I was a kid, they didn't make you do nearly as much research on your patron as they do now in confirmation prep. I only wanted the name because it was my grandfather's name. Okay? My grandfather, my, my favorite grandfather, my maternal grandfather was Antonio. And I was thinking a lot about him yesterday because he started in World War II and he was one of the engineers that stormed the beaches of Normandy that raised the blades on the bulldozer so that the infantry could get through. I don't know if y'all ever heard that story about the engineers that were. And I didn't learn to, you know, I was an engineer in the Army and I never knew that, that my story about my grandfather until after I got commissioned as an engineer officer and he sat me down in the backyard and started telling me stories. So anyway, he was Antonio, and I loved the man because he was, he was a carpenter and he was a fisherman. And he always would take us fishing. So when I was a kid, I loved, you know, we loved to go down to Houston, and at, we called him Pops, we didn't call him Wilito. And we'd say, Pops, will you take us fishing? And so I just grew to, you know, he was, I loved him very much. Uh, and so I wanted to honor him by taking his, uh, his name. I didn't have a middle name, and eventually took his name. So anyway. That's how I got St. Anthony. So St. Anthony was born in 1195. And by the age of 15, he memorized the entire Bible. So, you know, like last time we got together, we talked about the importance of at least having some key passages. You know, I'm not uh, advocating that you go try to memorize the entire Bible. But I think this is, again, a proof from one of the saints that um, you can do it. You know, there's not anything particularly special about memorizing stuff. It's just something, it's just a skill set you gotta work at. You know, we talked about having some key passages in your toolbox that you have memorized. And so he's evidence that it can be done. Excuse me, when he was about 21 years old, so actually before that, he um, he came, you know, like a lot of these early saints, he came from a noble family. And his parents were intent on him, you know, inheriting the family money and continuing whatever the family business was. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. He wanted to be um, a priest. And he initially joined the order of the uh, Augustinians. And when he was about 21, there were a group of friars that had returned to the town who had gone to Monaco to preach to the, to the Moors, to the, to the Muslims, and convert them. Uh, and several of them had been martyred in the process, and some of the ones that were coming back were, lame, uh, were maimed and injured. And so Anthony got it in his head that he too wanted to be a martyr. He wanted to go convert the Muslims. And so he set off for Monaco, but before he could get to Monaco, or right when he arrived in Monaco, it's not clear, he got sick. So he never made it. He didn't get what he wanted. And um, he finally recovered, and he got put on a ship to sent back home. And he wound up, um, the ship ran off course, and he wound up in Sicily, Italy, where he met another group of Franciscan friars, and he wound up becoming Franciscan. Which is kind of unusual. You don't normally hear people switching orders, do you? It's very rare. It's very okay. rare. So he became a Franciscan. And he was kind of a humble Franciscan. You know, he you know, helped clean the house and cook food and whatnot. And there was a particular day where they were having an ordination. And the priest that was supposed to give the homily that day was either sick or was detained and not able to attend. And uh, the friars called upon Anthony to give the homily. And uh, Well, everyone else before that had said, no, I didn't, I'm not wanting to do it. Just like me, not giving this. <laughs> so he gives the talk. So he gives the homily, and he starts off kind of slow and kind of quiet, and then he starts to go on a roll. And it's very evident that he has a gift of oration. And then he becomes known for being this great speaker. In fact, uh, churches would would be over would overflow with people wanting to come hear him speak. And so he's well known throughout the land as a great speaker. In fact, 
uh, one of the unusual things about St. Anthony is that you've, we've talked before when we've talked about saints about incorruptibles, right? All right, so for the benefit of maybe the one or two of you that have not been here for that, some of the saints are incorruptible, meaning that their bodies have not decayed. Okay, the, one of the best examples is that St. Bernadette. I mean, you see images of her, and she looks like she's just sleeping. You know, and it's been a couple of hundred years close to it. Um, no decay. Well, St. Anthony, his tongue did not decay. It's the only part of his body that was left incorruptible. Okay? Still as soft and in texture as our tongues would be. Um, and, you know, the church says that, the, that they believe that part of the reason that is, is because it's an indication of the the use of his tongue, the, you know, to speak, to spread the spread the gospel. In fact, he was named a doctor of the church, and he's what's called an evangelical doctor, meaning he spread the gospel throughout the land. So he died in 1231, and so we, we know him as the patron of lost things. Why? So I thought I'd share the story with you about why he's known as the patron of lost things. Anybody besides Tom remember one? okay if you don't. So, you know, in those days it was expensive to uh, make books. And he had a particular manuscript. I don't know if it was actually a set of Gospels or if they were just the prayers of the Psalter. Uh, that was one of his treasured... Uh, the source, I said, called the relic. Like, so it was even older than it predated him. And one of the... Uh, one of the friars took it to go sell, I guess to raise alms or something, I don't know. And um, Anthony was looking all over the place for it and began praying to our Lord that he find his book of prayers. At the same time he was saying his prayers, off somewhere else the friar had a vision of an angry Saint Anthony looking for his book of prayers and he brought it back. And so that's how the, the legend of St. Anthony being a, a patron or intercessor for lost things. So uh, he died in 1231, and you often, often see him portrayed in images holding the baby Jesus. Okay? Sometimes when you see statues of him, sometimes people confuse <coughs> his statue with other saints. But um, you can tell because he's got the, the shaved top of his head. What do they call it? Archer. Okay. Um, there's a wonderful statue of this at the uh, Meadows Museum at SMU. That is close to 500 years old. But uh, there's a story.